Hi, my name is Taka Sakaira. I'm a professional chef, and I'm gonna show you the best way to make tonkatsu at home. We're talking everything you need to know to make the most perfect, juicy, crispy tonkatsu. This is Tonkatsu 101. So tonkatsu, uh, very simply, is a pork tenderloin, generally, that has been breaded and then fried. The word tonkatsu directly translates to the ton part, means uh, referring to the pork, and katsu is actually shortened for katsuretsu, which is essentially cutlet. Just with uh, understanding a few techniques, executing a great tonkatsu at home is, is very simple. What I have in front of me here, this is a uh, pork shoulder, or sometimes known as a pork butt. So generally, tonkatsu is really made from the pork loin or tenderloin. I love to use pork shoulder here because it is a lot tastier piece of meat. It does have some connective tissue, but it ends up with a juicier and much more flavorful end product. And so all this extra fat on the top, I'm gonna go ahead and first trim that off, just so that we have a nice balance of meat and fat. And I'm just pulling and tugging away at the fat as I'm moving it. Do not use any forceful movement. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, check the bottom here too for any extra fat down here, or you know, you can see a little bit of blood vein there, so I'm just gonna go ahead and remove this little chunk. Great, so I'm uh, looking to cut just about a one inch slice, and after pounding, we're gonna pound this down to about a half an inch. So we all need healthy ways to relieve our stress, and so this is one of my favorite ways, and go ahead and give it a good whack. Right now, what I'm doing here is flattening the pork butt, but also through this process of pounding, I'm uh, tenderizing the meat, but also trying to hit these connective tissues in between here so that uh, it softens and kind of breaks down the connective tissue as well. We don't want it to get too thin, then the center will overcook, and so we're looking for this nice ha about half inch thickness is where we want to stop. One more step we can do here is, you know, wherever we see this connective tissue, we can use the tip of our knife and kind of just make some incisions here, which will help tenderize and actually make it easier to chew. We're just gonna use uh, salt and some pepper. Essentially, we're gonna dry brine this pork. So the dry brining is great for seasoning the pork, but also getting the flavor all the way throughout. Uh, it also helps to tenderize and soften some of that connective tissue, as well as tenderize the meat itself. And also through that dry brining, letting it rest overnight, it'll create a little bit of a dry surface on the outer layer, which will help to keep the panko crust very crispy. I'm gonna take this pork, put it on a uh, resting rack, and go ahead and put it in the fridge. Overnight will be sufficient. So, I uh, have this piece of pork that's been resting overnight. Uh, you can see the actual flesh of the meat has gotten a lot more deeper red. I have kind of our breading station. The flour, and then the egg wash in the center here, and the panko to my right. For the beaten eggs, it's just a couple eggs here, but I used a little bit of water just to loosen it. The big thing here is we wanna make sure that it is fully beaten so that the uh, whites and the yolks are fully incorporated as best as possible. So I'm just taking the pork here, placing it gently into our flour. So the point of this process is wet doesn't stick to wet and dry doesn't stick to dry. So first step here is to dry the surface by adding flour. And any excess here, we're gonna go ahead and dust it off. We're gonna go ahead and gently put this into the egg wash here. And again, we wanna make sure that this is fully coated. This is really important for the finished product. We wanna make sure that the panko is fully encasing the piece of meat. If there is any gaps, that will allow oil to penetrate in between the layers and potentially all of the breading will fall off. Bring this over and I'm gonna gently bring all the panko over the entire piece. And once I have it, fully covered here. I'm gonna go ahead and give it a firm press and trying to use even pressure all around and even getting the sides and making sure that the sides are nice and coated as well. Once it is fully encased, we can go ahead and take this and put this on a resting rack. We're gonna go ahead and let this rest for about five minutes. This will really help and make sure that the panko is adhering to the pork before we fry it. Anytime we're dealing with super hot oil, we wanna make sure that we have a vessel that's large enough so that there's no spilling over once we put the pork in. And obviously just always work cautiously around, no need to rush, take your time, and make sure do not burn yourself. For this tonkatsu, we're gonna be double frying to make sure that it's super crispy. The first temperature that we're aiming for is right around 350. And because when we put something in oil, it will decrease in temperature, we're gonna just set the temperature slightly higher. Uh, the temperature right now is reading right around 360 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm not gonna drop it in. So once we put the pork inside, we wanna make sure that we see bubbling right away. That's another indication that the oil is nice and hot. For this first frying, we're gonna put this in for approximately two minutes. This first stage is really to make sure that the panko is now being fried and encrusting the pork. If there's any excess 
panko in the frying oil. I'm just using a spider here just to remove anything. The stray panko will burn faster than the panko that is on the pork and will kind of taint the flavor of the oil. This is actually looking pretty good at this point. We have the panko is fully encrusted. I'm just giving it a flip in midway through. Once I have even coloring, I'm gonna go ahead and pull this out and let this rest. And just pulling it out nice and slow also allows the oil to kind of uh, release from the pork cutlet. And then I'm gonna let it rest on a resting rack. And the second stage here is really about getting the outside panko really crispy. My thermometer is reading right around 380. I'm gonna go ahead and lower the temperature just a little bit and go ahead and put the pork in for the second fry. And this stage here is just gonna be a couple minutes. Biggest thing here is really, we wanna pay close attention to the color of the panko. If the oil does get too hot or if it's in here too long, you will get turning from golden brown all the way into kind of a, almost a burnt color. Another indication of whether the pork is cut, cooked through is the size of the bubbles that are coming out from the pork. As the pork gets cooked, the moisture is being released. And so the bubbles will get smaller and smaller as we're cooking. Now my thermometer is right around 375 is really where we want it. So at this point here, also we can see that the pork is now starting to float a little bit. This is also another indication that the pork is almost ready. And so looking at the color, I think that we can go ahead and pull this out and gently putting this on a resting rack to cool. Right when it comes out, I'm gonna go ahead and just gently season the panko crust on the outside. So the pork is cooked throughout and you can hear nice and crispy. We're gonna let this rest and let it cool off a little bit before we go ahead and slice it. Obviously, we always eat with our eyes first, and so we want to make sure that when we're plating, it looks beautiful. First thing we're going to do here is go ahead and cut the pork. Since it is crusted in panko, the technique we're going to use here is kind of like a paper cutter. We're just going to create a angle here and just go straight down. The, the pork has been resting quite a little bit. The juices are not spreading out, which is important. If the juices are all spreading out, that's obviously going to get into the panko and soften the panko. And so we can see here, though, that it's nice and juicy still. So typically in Japan, especially in the home, everyone is buying this tonkatsu sauce. It is basically a tomato, onion, um, many different vegetables and created into a puree to create the flavor for this. The, the way I, I think about tonkatsu sauce is the way kind of I think about ketchup also in America. Uh, this is a product that no one is really making at home and everyone is happy to just purchase. So what I do have here is a karashi, which is a Japanese prepared mustard. It is a little bit different from your American style or European style. Uh, this is, has a lot more of a kick, but this is a typical accompaniment and mixed in with the tonkatsu sauce. Uh, we do have an accompaniment here with the tonkatsu. This is kind of very traditional that we have it with sliced cabbage. So this is just sliced cabbage, some white onions, and some shiso leaves here just to add some little uh, character to this salad. Just having the cabbage here adds a little bit of water and also helps to balance and counter kind of the richness of the tonkatsu. So at this point, this plating is ready. The last touch I'm gonna do here is just put the sauce over the tonkatsu. And there you have it, the best way to make tonkatsu. Gonna go ahead and take a nice center piece here. Mm. The crust is nice and crispy. The panko is, is nice and dry. The texture of the meat from the dry brining is nice and tender, beautifully juicy, and intensely pork flavor, which I love. So the tonkatsu sauce mixed with a little bit of karashi has a little zing, helps to balance out kind of the richness also in the pork. Knowing how to make any kind of katsu, I think is a great skill to have. This is relatively easy to do at home, and the results are fantastic.